Fifi Baptist Church. Our vision is to build our lives on Jesus and pursue the good of our community. And I want to take a moment this morning to celebrate a way that our church has been doing just that. Uh, just this last week in the mail, I received this uh, certificate with Room at the End, uh, a local homeless shelter here in Bridgeton, sending us this certificate honoring two years of us volunteering and serving families in distress in our community. So I just want to say thank you, church for partnering with Room at the Inn, and thank you for being willing to pursue the good of our community by serving families in our community that are in distress. Let's continue to pray for Room at the Inn, and let's celebrate how God is working through this incredible ministry. For everything that, um, that this church is doing to pursue the good of our community, and specifically with Room at the End, thank you for um, serving and doing that. And uh, man, as we gather together this morning, we're reminded today of the just joy that we have to gather together and to worship freely. So as we think about that and we think, you know, our staff right now together are reading a book uh, together. It's really devotional, but it's called Where Faith is Forbidden. And if you heard, there's an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. And Voice of the Martyrs tracks the, the persecuted church all over the world. And this is actually a, a devotion of 40 days of one of the leaders of Voice of the Martyrs who traveled to different countries all around the world to meet with Christians who had been persecuted and had been imprisoned for their faith. And we've been reading that and reflecting on that, and we get to think we have, um, really, our religious freedom is kind of an anomaly if you study Christian history. And so as we think about um, just celebrating Independence Day, know that our country is not perfect, far from it. But we have the freedom to worship, and I'm so thankful for that. But in addition to that, we also have the freedom to witness, don't we? We can go out and we can share our faith with people. And we don't have to worry about our lives being on the line for that. So as we think about Independence Day and everything that that entails, think about not only does it mean that we can gather together here and worship together as a church family freely, it also means that we can exit the doors of this sanctuary and we can go and we can share the truth of the gospel with the lost and dying world and not worry at this time about putting our lives on the line. As we read through this devotion of people who are serving in Iran and, and other places in the Middle East and Asia where and they are kicked out of their families for professing Christ, where they are imprisoned for professing Christ. And we are incredibly blessed by God to be in the position that we're in. So let's take advantage of that blessing, not just in gathering together here to worship with one another, but let's take advantage of it by going out and sharing that truth with people who need to hear it. So that is part of what we do with Room at the Inn, is, build, is pursuing the good of our community outside of these walls, and I'm thankful for your faithfulness in, in giving and serving at that particular um, uh, ministry and helping families that are in distress. So, I invite you at this time to turn to the book of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're continuing this series called True Fiction, looking at the parables of Jesus this summer. Remember these parables, I love that they're called, Jared Wilson says they're like postcards from heaven. They give us a glimpse of what life should be like if we're bringing heaven to earth like Jesus calls us to do. So, as you're turning there, one other thing that I want to mention as you're turning to Luke chapter 12 is there are opportunities for us 
um, to give to the church and the mission this morning. And if you're here with us in person, there are different boxes. You can drop off your offering as you leave the sanctuary this morning. Um, if you're worshiping with us online, you're, we're so glad you're joining us. And you can give online through our app or through our website, or you can mail in your tithe or offering. Just another way to worship is through our giving. As you turn here to, to Luke 12, let me just set the, the stage a little bit where what we're seeing here is Jesus has a man come and, come and talk to him, and he has, he has an issue that's come up. He, he and his brother have this inheritance battle going on. And many times back in the ancient Near East, if you had an issue that you need to be resolved, you'd actually go to a rabbi, and you'd get their wisdom in trying to help you navigate some of life's issues. And so this individual comes to Jesus and wants Jesus to give him some insight and, and wants for his brother to divide his inheritance with him. And then Jesus is going to respond to this completely uh, with a story that doesn't necessarily seem to answer the question, but really does. So with that being said, I ask for you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. One of our students, Drake, is going to be reading for us from Luke chapter 12 this morning. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? He then told them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you so much. We are so thankful for your word. God, we are reminded this morning that we don't want to build up treasure here on earth, but God, we want to build treasure in heaven. Lord, that we want to live for your kingdom, not for our own. God, that we want to pick up our cross daily and follow you. So we pray, Lord, for the next few moments, God, that you would turn, Lord, our mind's attention and our heart's affection to you and to your word. God, that you'd remind us of how good you are to each and every one of us. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So this brother wants Jesus to help settle a dispute that he has. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He doesn't want him just to settle the dispute, but he wants Jesus to say exactly what he wants Jesus to say, right? <laughs> How many times do you do that? Let's, let's pick up the Bible. Let's try to flip and find a verse to justify what we want, right? But Jesus sees that the issue that this brother has is much deeper than that. And so it's a heart issue. So he uses a parable to get to the heart of of the matter. Because what we see here is that this guy is really focused on the inheritance. He's really focused on the money, isn't he? And so the, at some point we get, we, we get to that point where we get really focused on that. Now, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes, you know, I think there's, there's something nice about the innocence of children. So my daughter turns four next month. And so we've been, t we've been tallying a list of all the different things she's asked for for her birthday. And as she's asked for these different things, there's this very obvious thing that she has no idea about money or what anything costs, right? 
So some of the highlights on the list of things that she's asked for, she's asked for a, uh, a baby Yoda hoverboard. Interesting, right? She's also asked for a real puppy, a real kitty, or this one's like the topper, a real baby. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, n- none of those are happening, right? She also would love a rainbow unicorn with wings. And the list just goes on. Jill actually has now started, like, we have, a, we have a piece of paper sitting by our calendar on our kitchen counter just to jot down the random things that she asks for. And she just kind of thinks, my birthday's coming up, so I'm just going to throw stuff out there, right? She has no idea what anything actually costs. But at some point in time, if we're not careful... Now, that's not healthy, just having no idea, but then we can get so fixated on the things of this world, can't we? And Jesus says this, he says, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Now, I heard an old preacher joke that I'd like to share with you if that's okay, where there was a man who did very well for himself here in the world. And he knew he was going to, he knew he was going to pass. Wasn't much longer in this world. And so he just praises God. He says, God, please, would you let me just bring something with me to heaven? So let me bring, bring something with me to heaven. So Jesus appears to him in this dream, right? And says, you know what? I usually don't do this. But sure, you go ahead. You can bring something with you to heaven. Go right ahead. So this man, when he wakes up from the dream, he thinks, I've got special permission. This is going to be great. So he takes some luggage, and he fills that luggage with solid gold bars. Shows up. He's at the gates of heaven. And, you know, Peter's right there waiting, right? And Peter says, oh, what do you have? Usually we don't have people that show up with anything, right? And he goes, oh, look at this. He sets the luggage out, opens up, and he's showing off these gold bars. And Peter said, I didn't know we were getting our roads redone, right? (laughs) The thing that is most valuable here on earth is something that we will tread upon in heaven, right? Right? I mean, it'd be like us lugging around suitcases full of gravel and thinking we've got something good going on. Now, if you happen to have a suitcase full of gravel and you want to go and help fill in our parking lot, you let me know, all right? We are working on it, I promise. But we get so fixated on the things of this world. And we get so focused on those things And what Jesus shares is, he shares this parable to help us think much more about eternity. The Bible is very clear. The Bible says that you and I, we are like vapors in the wind. We're a flower that quickly fades. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. And yet, if we're honest, so often Our focus is on the things of this world rather than the things of eternity. Jesus responds to this man, friend, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And I'll store all my grains and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. What we see right away from this parable, right away is we see a personal pronoun problem. We see a personal pronoun problem. In the span 
of three verses. Verses 17 through 19. This rich fool uses personal pronouns 11 times. 11 times. He is focused on himself. And what we see here is Jesus is telling this story rather than engaging in the debate. What Jesus is really showing us, he's laying out here in this simple parable, is he's laying out a secular humanist worldview versus a biblical worldview. You see the expression that Jesus uses in, in, in this, that he puts in this rich man's mouth. He says, I'm going to take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Eat, drink, and be merry. This was a very hedonistic expression. The idea is this life is all I've got. I might as well enjoy it as best that I can. This harkens back all the way to Solomon in Ecclesiastes, right? Where he says, I've tried it all. I've tried drink. I've tried food. I've tried women. I've tried everything. And he says, and it's all vanity. It's like chasing the wind. And yet, secular humanism in and of itself, it says, your life is all about you. You are the most important person in the entire world. In fact, whatever you should do, you should do it all for yourself. And our culture, if you really look at our culture, our culture is completely me-centered, isn't it? The concept of self is paramount. There's this really good book, it was um, Carl Truman, this brilliant uh, professor who wrote this book, it's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And he traces how you can go all the way back to the 19th century to see how this, this idea of moral anarchy that we've got to today, how that's all developed throughout time. He says, the seeds of today's moral anarchy where personal, emotional preferences are constantly confused with moral absolutes. Have you ever seen, have, do you see that today? Personal, emotional preferences. This is what I feel, and since I feel this way, this must be true. Instead of the concept of the truth, we have the concept of my truth. This is the seeds of that moral anarchy. You can go back to the 19th century, to Rousseau and the Romantics, who popularized the idea that our inner self was our true self. Then you have like Nietzsche or Marx or Darwin, who defined humanity without any reference to God. And this is what Truman says. He says, with no controlling metaphysical belief, human beings were free to define themselves according to their inner sense of self. He says, living in the 21st century then is living in a culture made up of people who see themselves as expressive individualists. Expressive individualists. And what, what Truman goes on to argue throughout this book is this idea of just the, the moral decay that we've seen, this idea that when, there's no, when there is no solid, absolute truth, anyone can say anything at any time and say, well, it's true for me. And he's saying this just ends up leading to chaos. And what happens is if we don't look to the Lord and we don't look to his word for our foundation of what we need to stand on, for how we can view things, things just get crazy. They go out of control. And what we see here is this fool in this passage. And Jesus uses the word fool. And we should pay attention that he uses that word. All right, the word fool is one of the biggest insults that you could give, all right, during this time. In fact, you know, it says back in Proverbs, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, right? The most foolish thing that we can do is to say, there is no God. 
I can determine whatever I want to determine about me, myself, and everything that's going on. So we have to step back and we have to ask ourselves, what choice are we going to make? Am I going to be self-centered or am I going to be God-centered? Am I going to be self-centered or am I going to be God-centered? He thought to himself, what should I do? I don't have anywhere to store my crops. I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and I'll big, build big ones to store all my grain and my goods. Then I'll say to myself, again and again and again, this fool is focused on himself. So, J.D. Greer, who's a um, pastor in North Carolina, he talks about this Copernican revolution that we all need. So you know anything about Copernicus? He was the guy, wrote this incredibly interesting book called On the Revolution of Celestial Spheres. Sounds great, right? The publisher only printed 400 copies and it flopped. Because this is what Copernicus said. He said, you know what? We have this understanding. It's called the Ptolemic understanding of the universe. We have this understanding that everything rotates around the earth, right? And even though if there are stars that are at different places, the reason why is because gods were warring, and that's why stars had moved. And Copernicus actually had the audacity. He said he just did a fun little math experiment. What if instead of everything being centered around the earth and having everything revolve around the earth, what if the earth is actually revolving around something else? What if the earth is revolving around the sun? You know, everybody in that day, all the experts in that day, they mock Copernicus, right? Like, you are ridiculous. But when he did the math, he was like, it actually makes so much more sense that we're revolving around the sun. In fact, we all understand that, like, the earth does not have the gravitational pull. If things were revolving around us, we'd just all explode and we'd be done, right? Right? It only makes sense, and our world only works with us rotating around the sun. It's the only thing that makes sense. And when God designed you and me, he did not design us to be the rulers of our own lives. He didn't. God designed you and me not to worship ourselves, not to worship the created thing, but God designed us to worship Him. And what J.D. Greer argues is he says, we need a Copernican revolution of the soul. We need to stop saying everything rotates around me, and we need to step back, and we need to say, hey, everything is all about the Lord. And life just makes sense when we're living for him rather than living for ourselves. Because ultimately what we understand is, man, our time on earth here is very, very finite. And eternity is forever. So where should our focus be? Where should our focus be? And that's what Jesus is saying. He, what he says here, and look, God says in verse 20, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? This is what God is saying and just a reminder to all of us this morning is that you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you, can you? And so let me... Ask, that, ask this question. Are we focusing more on earth or on heaven? Are we focusing more on earth or are we focusing more on heaven? Jesus asked this compelling question. And it's something that we need to all ask ourselves this morning as well. It says, these things that you have prepared, whose will 
they be? Whose will they be? Does that really even matter? Not really, right? It won't matter to this guy. He's gone. But Jesus is talking on his level to get his attention. And what Jesus is challenging this man in the, as he's sharing this prayer, what he's challenging all of us is he wants us to just to check our hearts and say, what are we, what are we most focused on? What are we most focused on? So my wife, she grew up the daughter of a pastor. And so she said a lot of times her vacations growing up was they would go to preview the youth camp that they were going to go to that summer, and they'd get to stay for a few nights at the youth camp for free. So that was one way that they could have a vacation. Or his dad would get, you guys know when you get the things in the mail about a timeshare, right? And it is, if you come and listen to this presentation, you get a, a free night, or you get tickets to Disney, or you get whatever, right? It's come listen to this presentation. So what my, my wife said, she remembers d- distinctly being dragged into this timeshare meeting with her parents. And they're going on and on, and, and, and those people ask, you know, and, and finally, my, my father-in-law, I guess he goes, like, this has been going way longer than you said. Like, I just want the free tickets, and I want to get out of here. And the timeshare people got a little uppity at my father-in-law, Jerry. And they said, wait, you came in here and you had no intention of buying anything? He said, no, I want the tickets for my family. And they're like, why would you come in here and waste our time if you don't even have the money to get, you know, to get this time share? They, they kind of went back and forth. I remember my, my wife said, she still remembers that her dad goes, I'm storing up my treasure in heaven. And he stormed out of there. But I think about that. I think how often we can just waste our time here on earth focusing on all of these things that don't really matter instead of building up our treasure in heaven. I want you to think just for a few moments about just the whole idea of retirement. Okay, I've referenced a lot of different books. I want to read one more story from a book. It's from a book called Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. But he says this. He says, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. I'll show you how to waste your life. Consider a story from the February 98 edition of Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who took early to retirement from their job in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. He said, at first when I read it, I thought this might be a joke, a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and the last great work of your life before you give an account to your creator is this, playing softball and collecting shells. Piper says this, picture them before Christ at the great day of judgment. Look, Lord, see my shells? This is a tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. It says, over against that, I put my protest. Don't buy it. Don't waste your life. I actually have a a good friend of mine who is working on his PhD and he's focusing on retirement. And what is the, what is biblical retirement compared to what we most often view retirement? He worked up a little slide, I think, that we're going to, that we're going to throw up there because I think this is, this is pretty interesting. But he says, here, here's, he talks about just the meaning of life. He says, this is what the world says for us. The world says, First 21 to 24 years of your life is all about education. Now, understand the purpose of education isn't necessarily to attain knowledge. The purpose of education is to attain a high-paying job. That's 21 to 24 years of your life. Then you work 40 to 45 years, and your purpose the whole time you work is save enough money to retire comfortably, right? 
Then you retire. If you're lucky, you get 20 to 25 years, right? The purpose is you relax, you don't work, and ultimately what you do is you leave everything behind, right? There's a Spanish proverb, and it's a little bit morbid, but it goes like this. There are no pockets in a shroud. And so what he does is he says, this is what the world says, and compare it with what the Word says. The Word says, life on earth is a vapor. And yet we have all of eternity to think about. And so what my friend is doing, he's writing about what is biblical retirement? Now, we're, retirement, this idea of American dream. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to stop working, but I am, I, I'm not saying it's wrong to stop getting a, a paycheck, but I am saying that if we are not living for Jesus our entire life, we're kind of missing the point, aren't we? So whatever we do, we live out our calling. We go, and we go to make disciples in our workplace, in our homes. That doesn't change when we retire. What it is, it's not, I'm going to move somewhere and collect seashells and not think about anything else but myself. It's the, man, I only have one life to live for Jesus. How am I going to do that? Many of us look towards those last 20 years, and if we're lucky enough, we might get them, right? Think I'm toiling to get to that point. While God says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. I'm not saying retiring is wrong. I'm saying retiring is wrong if you decide to be selfish when you retire. Does that make sense? I'm just saying, biblically, for us, we are to deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily, and follow after him. So what we see with this passage is, what, what's inferred, I think, that Jesus infers, is this guy says, I'm going to go build bigger barns and store up more stuff. And I think what Jesus is inferring is, why aren't you investing some of the gifts that God has given you into others who need it? What Jesus is saying is we should be investing instead of hoarding. We should be investing instead of hoarding. What does that mean to invest instead of hoard? That means I'm going to give generously of my time, of my talent, of my treasure. I'm going to serve others. I'm going to live for Jesus. He is going to be the ultimate in my life. Look what he says in verse 21. He says, that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What does it mean to be Rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich towards God? Kind of a weird thing to say, right? Jesus is saying, is your focus on earth, you want to be rich towards God? Well, you know, James 2.5 says that we should be rich in faith. That we should be rich in faith. To inherit the kingdom that he's promised us. It means that we are focused on him. Look what it says in verse 31. But seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, make money bags for yourself that won't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We seek first his kingdom. We want to be rich in Faith. Saying, God, it's not about me. 
I'm going to pick up my cross, and God, I'm going to live for you wherever you have me placed. I'm going to be on mission. And maybe for a lot of us, we think, well, we're pretty general, middle-class Americans. We sure don't have Bill Gates money, right? We don't have LeBron James money. What we have to understand is, compared to the rest of the world, we are incredibly blessed. So what we do is we just say, okay, what can I do to be rich in faith? What can I do to help serve others? What can I do to be rich towards God? I can remember there was a, a church I served at in Texas as a youth pastor, and we had a, a woman in our church. Her name was Helen Shopper, and she and her husband were both just retiring. They had incredible plans of what they were going to do, and then tragically, her, her husband died of a heart attack. And Helen was pretty devastated. She wasn't sure what, what next steps she could do. Well, in the midst of her grief, she went on a mission trip to Kenya with our church. She said, God told her while she was there, this is what you're supposed to do. She came back home to San Antonio. She sold all her stuff. She had a yard sale, sold everything, sold her house, and she moved to Kenya to spend her retirement years pouring into children there. Now, I'm not saying, hey, we all need to sell all our stuff and move to Kenya. Now, if God tells you to do that, great. We'll support you in that. But what I am saying is that each and every one of us, we just need to give God just a blank check to our lives. Say, God, wherever it is that you want me to go, whatever it is that you want me to do, God, I want to live for you. God, I want to be so focused on you that I want to build up my treasure in heaven. So he says this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The truth of the matter is, we can't serve two masters. And we can get so focused on the things of this world, and we can get so focused on ourselves. So when I look at this, this isn't ultimately a money issue with this fool, is it? It's a heart issue. He's decided it's all about me. And this is what our society tells us. Our society tells us it doesn't matter what the Bible says. If it feels right, do it. Our society tells us what you feel is more important than what God's Word says. And so what we all have to do as people of the Lord is we have to step back and say, God, I want to lay it all aside for you. Whatever that would look like, God, I want to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. God, I want to be rich in faith. As you look at your life, say, who am I living for? Am I living for myself or am I living for Jesus? There are times that we just need to set aside some of the things of this world so we can really run the race that Jesus would have for us. We want to pick up our cross and we want to follow after him. Let's not be foolish and focus on ourselves. Instead, let's invest in eternity. Let's use the time that we have for however long that we have it to live for the Lord and to point people to him. Because ultimately, in the end, that's what matters. Jesus is what matters. So let's live for him. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your word. I pray, God, that we would be a people that live for you. Lord, I pray we'd be a people that deny ourselves, Lord, that would pick up our cross, Lord, that would follow you. 
God, I pray you could just point out anything in our, in our hearts, in our lives, where we might be living for ourselves more than living for you. And God, I pray that you would speak to us and remind us, compel us, Lord, to take steps to fully surrender to you. Lord, be with us this morning. Work in our lives. And Lord, let us live for you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.